Hi everyone, this week we're going to look at what I think is one of the most interesting areas in all of sports psychology, that of aggression. And I've got two short PowerPoint presentations for you to watch before class. The first one here uh, will focus on defining aggression and explaining some theories that try to explain aggressive behavior. And the second one will focus on a number of factors relating to aggression. So the first thing that's of interest really is for us to consider whether sport is just inherently aggressive. It's competitive, we're trying to beat the other person, and does that automatically lead people to engage in aggressive behavior? Well, that's an issue we're going to consider this week. There are two views about it. Uh, one is that sport's actually really good for people because it helps control their aggression and their emotions. And that's a view often used, for example, when justifying uh, physical education in school. That Not only is it good for children physically, but actually we can use it to help control aggressive and other undesirable tendencies and improve their social skills. On the other hand, some people have argued that competitive sport teaches us to be aggressive and normalizes it rather than eliminating or channeling that emotion. So, very, very controversial area. So, first of all, let's define what we mean by aggression. So, I like this definition by Barron. It's controversial but I think it nicely sums up the key elements of aggression. So one point here is that it's uh, directed towards intentionally harming another living being. So if you're not trying to hurt somebody, but do so in an accident, that wouldn't be considered aggressive. The other point is that it has to be a living being. So can you be aggressive towards an inanimate object? Well, this definition would say no. And the other thing is that the other person must want to avoid that kind of treatment. So, for example, in the boxing ring, we could argue because both boxers consent to being hit, that hit a boxer hitting another boxer, technically we could question whether that's really aggression or not. So it's a behavior. It involves harming somebody else. It involves the intent to harm somebody else and it's directed towards uh, humans or other living beings. So here's uh, another uh, definition of aggression, a bit broader, a sequence of behavior in which the goal is to injure another person. Very old definition as you can see, but this is important because it implies that aggression could be physical or verbal. So you could trying to be trying to hurt somebody through words assertiveness is a different thing assertiveness is where we're trying to exercise legitimate uh, physical or verbal force to gain an advantage so for example a forceful tackle in football or a tackle in rugby where we hit the player backwards those things aren't against the rules sometimes there's a fine line of course between what's within the rules and what's outside it. But assertive behavior has no intention of hurting the other person. And there's two types of aggression. We have instrumental aggression, where we're not trying to injure an opponent, but gain an advantage. So if a boxer is trying to force a stoppage uh, by further damaging a cut above the opponent's eye by keeping on jabbing at that, then that's instrumental aggression. They're not trying to hurt the person, they're trying to gain an advantage. But sometimes in sport we see hostile aggression, which is where the aim is to actually inflict an injury to somebody else. So for example, if you get really angry after a player's fouled you, and you, you're angry at them, and you kick out at them to hurt them, then that would be hostile aggression. So there we are. So we have hostile aggression and instrumental. 
So instrumental aggression in a combat sport would take the attitude of, well, I'm sorry, but I'm doing this to win. I'm not trying to hurt you. Hostile aggression, on the other hand, might be, well, that's for trying it on with my wife in the bar last night. But it's not always clear cut. There's clearly going to be grey areas and areas where there might be a bit of both and it's quite difficult to distinguish one from the other. So there's a certain ambiguity. So as we can see, all three can overlap. So here's some examples for you to consider whether they're aggressive or not. Two netball players collide when going for a ball. What do you think? Well, I would say that's assertive. They're going for the ball, but they're not trying to hurt each other. What about when jumping for a ball, a centre forward strikes out with an elbow to prevent his opponent getting near the ball? In this case, I would definitely say it was aggressive. And a cricketer, after being bowled out for a duck, smashes hers, his or her bat against a changing room door. Well, because it's an inanimate object, most definitions of aggression would say that's not aggressive, although there are psychologists who would disagree. So what theories have people come up with to try to explain aggressive behaviour? Well, there's four key ones we're going to look at to, uh, in this session and then in the next PowerPoint we're going to look at a load of other factors that might influence aggressive behavior. So we have Freud's instinct theory, the frustration aggression theory or hypothesis, the social learning theory and a more recent revised frustration aggression theory. So Freud's instinct theory basically says that aggression is unavoidable and innate that all human beings have the capacity to be aggressive but what we can do is we can um, release aggression through socially acceptable activities such as um, playing a competitive sport so freud argued that sport is good because it can channel aggression into socially acceptable forms and this is something called catharsis and the idea is that it lowers your drive to be aggressive until that builds up again and then you need to release that aggressive feeling. However, the evidence doesn't seem to su support this. It seems to suggest instead that when children get involved, for example, in aggressive behaviour in sport, they're more likely to be aggressive the rest of the time. That didn't seem to work out too well. And then uh, Dollard and colleagues came up with this frustration, frustration aggression idea. So the basic idea here is that aggression happens when we get frustrated, which makes sense. We can all think of examples when we've become um, frustrated in sport and maybe we've, we've lashed out or maybe we've lashed out verbally at people when we're frustrated. However, we also know that sometimes we can get frustrated and not be aggressive. And also we know there are some acts of aggression that don't happen from frustration. A lot of instrumental aggression has nothing to do with frustration. So on its own, this theory didn't seem to work too well. So then Berkowitz came along and suggested that we should combine frustration aggression theory with another theory the social learning theory to try to explain aggression and the social learning theory developed by Bandura who we'll, we'll talk about uh, in class basically argues that aggression happens through the observation and reinforcement of aggressive behaviors such as watching role models who could be parents coaches uh, sports people that children idolize for example it could be watching things on the tv uh, acts in in video games like call of duty or whatever and these things greatly influence children's likelihood of growing up uh, to be aggressive also depends on the success of using aggressive behavior so if they see aggressive behavior being rewarded and they've had it rewarded in the past, such as by a very lenient referee, 
they're more likely to use it in the future. That's social learning theory. If they see that behavior being punished, they're less likely to engage in it. So aggression, therefore, is a learned response, according to learning theory. And in sport, we can all think of examples where we are encouraged to be aggressive. A recognition from teammates where we put in a really hard tackle, take one for the team, maybe get a booking when we foul another player when they're nearly through on goal. From coaches, fans who really like players to be uh, aggressive in some circumstances and the media where these acts are sometimes kind of glorified and punishment can be minimal so for example somebody like Vinnie Jones who wasn't one of the best footballers in the world but ultimately he carved out a, you know an acting career a career outside of football based on his reputation as a hard man so by being aggressive he actually was rewarded for that so the theory is that makes uh, children more likely to be aggressive because they can see him being rewarded for being that sort of character. <coughs> Pardon me. So sometimes players learn physical intimidation and violent behaviours also as strategies because they're used to win games and win in life. We know there's lots of violence on TV and in, in video games. Society encourages winning and winning becomes a stronger influence than necessarily behaving morally. So increased rewards also for getting the right result might increase aggressiveness but also potentially aggression as well. Now, this seems to make a lot of sense, but there have been criticisms of social learning theory and the research that's um, examined it. So, for example, in um, Bandura's original studies, which were done using uh, children hitting dolls after watching role models such as teachers do the same, uh, the dolls in question, there was nothing else you could really do with them. They were designed to be hit. And hitting a doll isn't the same as hitting a human. The assumption's been that because children were more likely to hit dolls when they saw their teacher, for instance, hitting the doll, doesn't mean they're more likely to hit humans. It also ignores the possibility that in some children, aggression might be innate, in some more than others. But these were laboratory experiments. Did they really reflect the real world? We're not sure, and the samples used were quite small. They were quite small studies. How representative were they of children in general and from other socioeconomic backgrounds, for instance? We don't know. So some criticisms of social learning theory, but I do think social learning does make sense as one of the influences on aggressive behaviour.